Christ. All right, welcome everybody. Surrounding County has opened its doors on October 31st, 2020. Thank you all for joining us tonight to commemorate our third birthday. Zach has worked long and hard to provide our community with quality food as well as specialty coffee, as well as making all of us customers and employees feel welcomed and appreciated. Um, for over 100 years, coffee shops have been the meeting place, a safe space in which you are openly and freely to exchange ideas and express yourself. Artists sit and sketch, writers sit pose, pen in hand, more likely fingers at the ready to the keyboard to type out their next great work, and dreamers sit and dream over coffee gone cold while they were lost, swept away in their thoughts. A place where both blue collar and white collar come together, sipping steams of caffeinated motivation, and the students slip in and out, right with drinks, food, and friends in hand. It only seemed fitting to throw a haiku jam on our third birthday, today being the third month. Tonight, it's our privilege to invite the one and only Dirt God, Raven Matt, to see the Raven's a writer, a zine maker, an artist, a DJ, and a haiku master. You can often catch his work slowly trudging by Marco on old train cars like fresh new tattoos his moniker riding high among the greats. Speaking of greats, Buzz Blur once said, if you pro proclaim yourself an artist, anything you produce is art. With that said, I'd like to welcome the Prince of Purple, which is today's color. Our own Stuffy Smith meets DJ Screw, and the man who runs on horsepower, Mr. Dirt God Raven Matt. So yeah, I'm Raven Matt, a.k.a. Dirt God, a.k.a. I got a whole bunch of other names. Um, I am an artist. I have a day job. I don't get paid off of art, like, for a living. I have a, I'm have a lowly bureaucrat during the day. But luckily I work from home, so mostly I fuck off and do art at home during the day now, too. Um, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for what you said. Thank you for the space. It's interesting, I had a thought when you were talking about the space and people congregating. I live near Charlottesville, and my partner Dolly, we met in 2018. And most of y'all, when you think of Charlottesville, what do you think of? UVA. Think of UVA, probably think about what happened a few years back. So we actually met in the one year anniversary of that because I volunteered to do community care, and she was coordinating community care. And you talk about spaces like this, we had a spot that we had a haiku slam at the one year anniversary when they locked down downtown Charlottesville, like it was like a militarized zone and you had to walk through a checkpoint to get to the place. And we went to a space not unlike this and a group of people brought their haiku and we had a haiku slam and we shared resistant thoughts, rebellious thoughts, all the things we had to say. We shared it in a space that was community it wasn't just about buying something or spending money or having to do that. I mean, obviously, we want surrounding counties to be successful, and you want to support a good business. But capitalism just pervades in our life, man. It just chokes the fun out of everything. You know what I'm saying? It just weighs on us like this invisible demon all the time. So I'm appreciative of spaces like that because we get to cross-pollinate with each other, and we get to expand our own communities that we live in. So. I don't know if I'd call myself a haiku master because I still wrestle with it all the time. I did start writing haiku regularly, probably about 15, 16 years ago, I don't know. And I did a book called Beer Box Haiku, and it's called Beer Box Haiku because at the time I was actually a self-employed, alcoholic house painter. So you can't exactly have like no laptop or notebook or anything when you're 30 feet up on a ladder. So I started carrying note cards in my pocket, which I still do to this day. I always got note cards in my pocket. And I would write my thoughts in haiku form while I was on the ladder, when I was in the truck, wherever I was at during the day. And to show y'all what an alcoholic I actually was, I used to save my empty 12-pack boxes, and the beer box haiku actually comes from these boxes. It's like I did like 150 of them that are full of four haiku on each panel. 
and I drank all that beer myself. I, ain't sh I, mean, I probably shared some of it, but I had a little camper behind the house that my family lived at at the time. I ain't gonna lie, I drank most of it by myself. But it's funny to think about who I was then when I did this book, because I was a very different person. Like, I don't even know, I didn't pick no page, I'm gonna just open it up, I bet I find some one that's just, yeah, like, wood stove down to ash and scattered coals cold morning in a country home. Black panties, the last resistance to sexual advances, silkish. Woman's aroma in my unwashed mustache hairs, last night's escapades. Buxom brown-eyed girl smiles triggering south of the border fantasies. It goes on like that, like, and I wasn't necessarily a bad person, but I wasn't the best version of myself. You know what I'm saying? And now, I just put out this year, this book. And it's funny, y'all's birthday is October 31st because my sobriety anniversary is October 30th, 14 years this past year. And it's funny because I get excited about it. Now, I didn't go to no 12-step meetings and all, kind of just did it on my own, but if you do know people in recovery, it's like they had a baby because they're like, I've been sober for three weeks. I've been sober for four months. And you talk about it like when you got a baby, because it's like four months old, five months old, six months old, one year. Oh, my sobriety's two. My sobriety is 14, and the person I was when I stopped drinking, I had no idea that I would actually enjoy life sober. None. No clue. I thought that was who I was supposed to be, and I was going to be dead before I was 45, like my father and my grandfather. But I stopped it. And it seemed like I actually enjoyed writing, living, being a dad, doing dumb shit. I actually enjoyed it more sober. And it didn't make me straighten up. I ain't nobody's like, well, y'all gotta be sober. Because everybody's different. I just got that problem, you know? That's why I think, what's up, y'all? Come on in. I'm just babbling. Let's hear it. <laughs> but like, what I picked up in that time, you talk about Buzz Blur, Colossus of Rhodes, that's a hero of mine. I've mailed, exchanged poems. He's bought my books. He actually bought this one and the vehicular Tonka side direct for me. And it was my proudest moment as an artist because I love him because he did art for years. If you don't know who Buzz Blur is, Colossus of Rhodes, he was a brake man in Arkansas, third generation railroad guy. But he also is a mail <laughs> artist. And he would write on trains all the time and these beautiful little pieces of poetry on a train that nobody can own. It just scatters on down the road. So I started doing that too. So you talk about writing on trains, you kind of replace one addiction with another. So I don't drink no more, but I do scribble on a whole lot of fucking trains, man, anytime I can. But that's actually the cover of this. It's got my Dirt God moniker that I write on trains. So you might see that. You might not. They go by and you never see it. And this is where I am now. I landed in Skyland, VA. How many of y'all ever seen the TV show, The Walkers? Y'all remember that? It's old, back in the day. That's the town I live in, right down the road from John Boy Walton's house. And I'll read something from here because this is a little different. The place where my heart is feeling partially seized like rusty bike chain. Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting, work life moving slow as sewage seat. Eating leftover barbecue chicken in a pink velour hoodie. Not damn right, boy. My kids inherit existential questions and not a whole lot more. Wandering back roads where my daddy used to buy crank back in the day. Multicolored flags signifying pipeline work and gravel pull off. So I'm a different person now. I ain't no drunk piece of shit. I'm a sober piece of shit. I'm still an outlaw, I'm still an outcast, I'm still a misfit, but that's why I do art. And that's actually why I started writing life too, because when I was an alcoholic house painter, wrestling with these things, I had three children and a wife, and we started growing apart. Not me and my children, me and my wife. And it was hard, man, because I never knew how to express myself, or say things, or even advocate for myself, because I grew up in a chaotic home, you know? You don't know those things. Like I said, my father and grandfather both died in their 40s. I didn't see a long life. Who the hell gonna advocate for themselves and you like, I'm gonna die when I'm 45, who gives a fuck, you know? Mm -hmm. Started to learn to unwind my thoughts through 17 syllables at a time. Lord have mercy, it has helped so much. So, we've done that for years. I started doing haiku slams, which is different than a jam. 
It's like an actual competition. <laughs> and we did that. I've been doing that for 10 years between Charlottesville, Richmond. I've done it in other states and other places. Uh, also, when you walk the railroad tracks, you'll find a lot of these haiku spikes, or a lot of spikes. I started collecting these and carving haiku onto the spikes. So ones that I really love, I will carve onto the spike only once, and then they're gone. And um, I sell these, but I give away as many as I sell, and mostly I just build a big pile of them to clutter. And actually, in the past year, I've been getting back to the magic of it too, because poetry is magic, art is magic, not just commodity. These have been used, not haiku spikes, but railroad spikes. They've been used in southern magic for many, many years. People would drive them in the ground around their house for protection. A lot of energy went into forging each and every one of these haiku spikes. So I actually carve haiku on the spikes with messages that I want to have be powered by that haiku, by that spike. And I actually put them in the ground with this point pointing in the direction I want it to flow. So I'll make a bunch and drive them in the ground different places. I've driven them places I want them. I've driven them places as protection against things I need protection from. So they're not just art, it's not just haiku. It's magic, y'all. It's magic. So when I say I got a day job and I'm a lonely bureaucrat during the day and I do art at night, or during the day too, to be honest, I don't give a damn about getting paid for my art because I don't ever want it to start crushing me that I gotta do it. This is my release, this is how I breathe, this is how I be easy in this world. And that's what the practice of haiku means to me. It helps me unwind those thoughts, release that tension in my chest, let it all out. Sometimes I write stupid funny shit, sometimes I write sexy stuff, sometimes I write serious stuff. This one, living your theories in actual practice is how you become real. Living your theories and actual practice is how you become real. Because when you have a theory or a philosophy about your life, but you're not living by it, you're not being real. You're just saying you something without actually being it. So, living your theories and actual practice is how you become real. So I like that one. That's basically what I'm about. I do zines as well because I lived in Richmond. I was a first generation college student back in the 90s at VCU, came to college, and just to give you an idea where my dad's from, my parents were 17 when they had me, and my dad would drive from Aaron, Virginia. He only brought me like two times because he hated Richmond. And when we got to Hall Street, once we got past the Chesterfield Park and the exurbs, when we started to get to the spots that he remembered when my uncle was a biker, he would have to sometimes come get him, he'd pull his gun out and sit it on the seat. So he would drive me to school at VCU with his fucking pistol out on the seat because he was sure we was going to get robbed just driving to fucking VCU. First generation college student, barely finished, didn't do well, but I graduated, baby. Graduated <laughs> college, wrestled with everything for years and years. I only finally started settling down and finding my path in life once I started doing this stuff more. I did zines back in the 90s, and I don't talk about them a lot, but I don't deny them. My zine back in the 90s was called the Confederate Mac. That word's got a way different tinge now than it did back then. I did some edgelord bullshit back in the day. And I did it because I was a first generation college student surrounded by kids from the suburbs. And a lot of them was punk rockers that I was hanging out with. Some of them didn't seem to be living their theories in actual practice. You know what I'm saying? There was a certain amount of hypocrisy I saw sometimes, being I didn't know how to express myself well back then. Instead of saying, you know what, I think we should have a dialogue and figure this out, I would just say crazy shit trying to scare people. So that's what I did. Unfortunately, a lot of people ended up loving it. So then I became a caricature almost, the Confederate Mac guy, Raven Mac, the Confederate Mac guy. But that changed over the years, having children settled me down, moving to the country settled me down and by the time I got sober Confederate Mac had long been retired and now we in the Southern Gothic Futurist era baby. I got Southern Gothic Futurism everywhere. I got SGF up here, I got the patch on me. Southern Gothic Futurism is throughout Greater Appalachia in the South 
There's been places, there's a couple places in Virginia, the Dismal Swamp had a spot, the mountains had a spot. It's called triracial isolates. Y'all know what that is? It is a spot where you got a Venn diagram of humanity and you got some broke ass runaway white people, you got freed and or escaped slaves back in the day, and you got indigenous people that was living together in the same circles and making their own places separate from what was happening in America. It wasn't like we're going to be our own town now and be part of Virginia. No, nah, they was like, fuck it, man, fuck this. We're going to go do our thing. Screw that. Southern Gothic futurism is that philosophy because a lot of people make you feel like we're living in the end times. But I'm here to tell you, well, how many people was on Earth? Eight billion? Something, yeah. yeah. So if we got eight billion people on the Earth and 80% of the people died in the next 10 years, you still got a billion motherfuckers running around. Somebody got to be stubborn and keep walking. Ain't no end times, man. We ain't going to hit no wall where it's like, that's it, y'all. We done. Y'all go back. We finished. It ain't going to be like that. You got to have some stubborn, I don't give a fuck, willing to resist as people to keep on living. So that's what Southern Gothic Futurism is about. It's about all the people, black, white, and brown. And when I say brown, I think of indigenous people, not just Latino, but indigenous. Latino people are indigenous to Central and South America. So I think about those people coming together and figuring out what's next. You know what I'm saying? It ain't got to be end times. So that's what I'm about. If y'all got haiku you want to share, I'm going to pull out my pocket because I brought with me the stack I organized this week. Hopefully I'm going to carve these tomorrow. But I'll put a couple of this at the top of the stack. Spiritual paths through a material world will be seen as lost. Imbalance between the physical and mental leads to crookedness. 1,000 year old hound dog anxiously panting for my chicken bones. <laughs> so I like this. There's a um, line in Beowulf about the doom of body. And my friend had reminded me of that about like when you have doom in your mind, you end up fulfilling that destiny of doom. Doom abided our assumptions of early death we lived our lives by. And I actually wrote that on my mom's front porch who I was estranged from but who died last month. And one of the women that was there, that she had this group called the Women at the Round Table. And Flukio is her, well that's her name. That ain't her name, but that's what she goes by. Flukio was talking about, all right, I'm just going to let y'all have some Southside Virginia. Flukio lives with Richie. They live in a trailer outside of Dillwood. Little Richie is Richie's son. Little Richie's 42 years old, but he's still called Little Richie. <laughs> Little Richie ain't got no damn sense. He done wrecked his motorcycle. He don't take care of his kids. His knee is all fucked up, and he won't get it fixed. And you know why? They asked him, Little Richie, how come you don't go to the doctor? He's like, shit, I ain't going to live with people like 45. No ways. Why am I going to go to the doctor? What is it about my people that is thinking like that? But Little Richie would climb up into the chicken coop because he didn't want to bother nobody at the house cut the light on the chicken coop, and sleep in the chicken coop, drunk with his busted up leg he couldn't get up on. So I wrote that because I was thinking about when you're thinking you're going to die at 45 your whole life, good chance you're going to die by 45. You know what I'm saying? Because you're putting that out there. So I am thankful that I somehow cleared that hurdle. I'm 50 years old now. I'm feeling like I can go another 40 years. I hope so, because I like annoying motherfuckers with stories. <laughs> so that's what I'm about. If any of y'all got a haiku you want to share, or if you want to write one on the spot, I don't always give people prompts, but I can. Usually I just say whatever you're thinking about. When we do the haiku slams, Kathy's been in the haiku slams, Jesse and Stan will come to them. They are wide open to everybody. I love having actual poets there, and I love having people that ain't never considered themselves a poet. I love trying to get my rapper friends to do it. I love trying to get the crazy people that work in the kitchen and restaurants to do it because they tend to be the best poets. I firmly believe we're all poets. Just like you say Buzz Blur was saying, we're all artists, we're all poets. If you was ever trying to think how you gonna explain something, playing it around in your head, how am I gonna say this? I gotta say this thing. Like if you came home late when you was a teenager, and you're trying to lie about what you was doing. You're playing it back in your head, trying to figure out how you're going to say it. That's poetry, man. 
because you're trying to figure out the best way to put the words so you can convince somebody to feel what you want them to feel. So you all poets, even if you don't never practice it, you're a poet. And all you got to do to make it real, write it down, baby. That's all it takes. So that's my philosophy. Um, I done talked enough with y'all. Hopefully somebody got something to share. If y'all want to ask a question, I ain't an authority on shit. But y'all want to ask a question, you can. Who you want, man? Tell them how to, about your Patreon. Oh, this, yeah. How to get in touch with you. <clears throat> I got a Patreon. Patreon, if y'all don't know what it is, it's an online thing where you can subscribe on a monthly basis and support people who support my Patreon. They get zines. Um, some of them get buttons at certain levels. It's chaotic, man. I do a lot of stuff online, so it's a lot of posts on there. I got one of the most prolific Patreons I've heard of. I don't got no podcast, though. Most people be doing podcasts, but I can't do no podcast because I don't like <laughs> I don't listen to a podcast, so I can't do a podcast, you know? Like, how am I going to do something I don't listen to? But um, I got these business cards, Dirt God, Raven Mac, Southern Gothic Futurism. Gothic spelled with two C's, by the way. <laughs> Greater Appalachian Unorthodox Priest of Illegitimate Arts. And it's got my Patreon on there. And if y'all here tonight, man, feel free to take a zine. I do sell zines and buttons, but y'all free. If y'all came out tonight, take a zine. You know what? Just have one. Get a taste of what I'm about. I will warn you, if you take a zine, the pink one is an all-wrestling one, which I accidentally did. I didn't mean to do an all-wrestling issue, but then I accidentally did. So if you take that one, just have the little asterisk beside your head when you're looking at it that I don't write about that all the time. I just kind of stumbled into that one. So I switch all the time. I love soccer, so I write about that. I love chickens. I love, I love everything. So whatever I feel like I'm loving on, I indulge in, you know? That addictive behavior, baby. It don't ever go away. You just got to point it in the right direction. And I got some of these spikes, too. Y'all can check them out. Like, a lot of times with art, people be like, you can't touch it or you're not supposed to touch it. These are meant for touching, man. Pick them up, hold them, feel them. You can feel how strong they are, how good they are. I don't know if y'all saw that video I did where I was like, you can stab people with. Because I, I used to call this writing you can stab people with. Because literally it is. You could stab somebody with a spike if you wanted. Like, I mean, it's not going to puncture the skin too well, but it ain't going to feel good either, you know? So, Kathy's been to haiku slams. Dolly has. Silver is filming. If anybody wants to say something you want him to film, I forgot to point out Silver is filming. You can tell him to cut the camera off. We, can make him, we ain't trying to snitch on nobody or have nobody's identity exposed. Like so let's share some haikus. Yeah, what y'all got? I wrote some haikus, but they're like... I got no buttons. Well, I mean, it's just, you know, I'm a different person, so it's a different scene. Yeah, when I do, I do haiku slams monthly through November and then stop at them in Charlottesville and Richmond. We have one November 16th at Shelf Life Books in Carytown. Y'all come out that evening and check it out. But one thing I always say is like, there's no, no explaining your haiku because your haiku is legitimate if you wrote it. Like you don't have to, like too many places where people share poetry, somebody's a gatekeeper and says you gotta do it a certain way. I ain't like that, man. I want everybody to do it. So I um, came into haiku because I also, I'm a second generation VCU graduate and I took a bunch of um, Eastern religion classes, haiku classes, the greatest teacher there at the time, Charles Edward, was fabulous scene. So I constantly refer to myself as a haiku master, just so you guys all know. <laughs> um, there are a couple people around town, I also agree that um, hip hop guys, rappers should all be haiku masters. Absolutely. Um, art is for everyone, and this is an easy way to express yourself. So these are just three that I wrote this morning. Fall stays dwindling. The candy has been eaten. Soon winter solstice. Yellow petals fall. My windowsill catches them. Nature's one last chance. A cup of water supports a tree of basil. Life grows anywhere. With the fall in mind, I wrote one on the way here tonight because I've been doing like I do five a day now. That's my plan, and like the Islamic calendar is five prayer times during the day. 
So I have an Islamic prayer reminder app. So I know five times a day I should try to write a haiku. And the cool thing about that is that's tied to the celestial bodies too. So you're like writing according to the position of the moon and sun. But I wrote one for fall too. Let me see if I can remember. Kudzu shriveling after first fall. Kudzu shriveling after first frost. Ambitions paused until spring. Or ambitions paused. Ambitious pause till after winter, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so my idea for throwing this haiku jam tonight came from two people. Um, one is Kathy, uh, and the other one is not here with us. Um, he's still alive. He's still alive. He's not here. He's not here with us tonight. So. I'm on his behalf going to share two of his haikus that he put in the public journal, which is here for anybody's consumption to add That's awesome. or whatever. We um, we love it. There's so like here, so in there, right? Yeah, yeah. There's several in here. I'm going to share two with you. Um, the barefoot prophet, cops <laughs> laid hands, took him off to take their drugs. These fuckers get me. No one else seems to care. Surrounding counties. <laughs> um, uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as the founder of Surrounding Counties and uh, de facto host and uh, resident um, published uh, haiku artist, um, randomly back in the day, um, a little, uh, little backstory on this haiku was I uh, one time got to play bicycle polo out in Portland, Oregon, and it was like the most fun I'd ever had playing a sport. It was like exhilarating, it was unorganized, it was chaotic, but it was also something you could do and create and build um, and just, just have a lot of fun with, with strangers. And I brought that to Richmond, Virginia with me when I came to visit them for the first time. And uh, we started playing bicycle polo, and it became a thing, and I moved away. Um, and while I was gone, some people that I had introduced the game to kept playing and they became some of the best bicycle polo players in the world and they get to travel around the, the planet. There was actually bicycle polo equipment companies that were producing things and sponsoring people. Um, and in the height of all this, uh, Need Supply was a local Richmond company that was internationally renowned um, for their curation of style and like $400 blue jeans and things like that. And they would produce a journal every year, or a quarterly journal, the Need Supply Journal. And they contacted me because they wanted to have something about bicycle polo in the Need Supply Journal. Um, and they wanted me to write an article about it as, you know, um, you can also find me in the NPR history of bicycle polo in Richmond. <laughs> and then the archives just backs all this up. Um, so they came to me and they were like, oh, hey, um, can you write an article? And so I wrote a haiku. And the haiku, um, it's, it's in the Need Supply Journal. Uh, it's a picture of a tennis court of people playing bicycle polo. And I wrote it down on a Sharpie on a, uh, on a, on a bag from Lamplight in my previous uh, coffee shop. And I just gave it to him. So it's even in my handwriting in the journal. It says, of life's many joys, playing bike polo with friends, the rest is just noise. <laughs> nice. I guess since I, I was part of the inspiration, mm -hmm. tonight, I should um, read a haiku or two. And so um, I came to haiku because I teach elementary school, and haikus counting out the syllables is really good skill for children to be able to do. And so yeah, I taught did that in middle school, a little bit in elementary school, and my students now are curious because you know I've been doing a lot more of it lately. I don't know why. There's like a book that you can write it in when you sit and have coffee. Um, so, I guess I'll do three. Three is the magic number. Um, random haiku is what I like to do when I sit and do nothing. Mm -hmm. Hear ruckus and tree. Squirrels wait lively. I keep their secrets. <laughs> These squirrels are just awesome. They're in my backyard. A couple of cats. So. Damn cats killed squirrel. Just a tiny little babe. Instinct wins again. <laughs> now, 
I'll hype Kathy up a little bit too because she comes to our haiku slams and shelf life books. And because of Dolly's efforts in getting funding for what we do, we have $100 in prize money every month at the haiku slams. We've paid out like probably like twelve, thirteen hundred dollars this year alone, and probably a couple thousand over the last few years. Sometimes we're begging people to give the money to support it, but the whole philosophy is artists should be rewarded. Even if you don't have something physical that somebody can take home that's transactional, I want artists to be supported. So I feel like I probably paid more people for poetry than almost any entity in the state this year. But Kathy won our haiku slam last month. So Money to get home by doing it. <laughs> hey guys, I'm James. Uh, I helped Zach open uh, the counties here three years ago. It was really fun. Uh, it's really exciting that everyone's here on our birthday today. Um, I did a haiku or two this morning as well. Nice. Because uh, uh, most of my art is like tea. You should have it that day. <laughs> um, this one's, this, this, all right. <laughs> Surrounding counties. Surrounding counties haiku. Surrounding counties. <laughs> <laughs> Surrounding counties. It's close to a haiku. Surrounding. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, everybody, for coming. It's really so nice to see all of your faces here. Anybody else want to share one? I got one. I got just one. All right. Let's uh, see my name is Bill. I just moved here. Um, Bill, so before you start, yeah, can you just tell people about your background? Oh, because yeah, sure. Bill's really awesome. He just moved here. He is Bill. Not, just, not just Bill. Our good friend Lele here just won her second golden hammer. Oh, yeah. 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 Which, is, which is a big architectural yeah. award. Big so big. give it up for both of them. But yeah, Bill, give people yeah, some background um, real quick. So I played music for a long time. Um, I'll gloss over that, but that was a lot of fun. Did that for almost two decades. Uh, and then I started making films, made a bunch of documentary films, I think like four of them, uh, true crime podcast, um, a pilot. I just love making stuff, and I love words. I'm writing a true crime novel right now, and uh, about David Berkowitz, Son of Sam, if you know that person. <laughs> uh, person, yeah. <laughs> um, good person to not know too well. Uh, I wish I knew him less. Um, so yeah, but Stanley told me about this, and I, I wrote this down, but I couldn't um, see it because I didn't have my glasses on, because we were dressed up. So I checked it just now, and it is the right amount of souls. So. <laughs> it just says, uh, want to live life right? See how the wild birds fly east. No one dies here now. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. As a practitioner of iron on leather t-shirts, I want to know what's on your shirt. Oh, this is just a boxing shirt from the gym here. Okay. What's it say, though? Uh, it's very hostile. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Yeah, the so Rollins. <laughs> and it's funny because the one we did in Charlottesville, a young woman um, who I've known since she was little, and her brother actually overdosed a couple years ago and died, so she's gone through a whole lot, not to mention her childhood. But she started sharing the past two months, and she wrote some haiku that weren't 17 syllables, and it like actually inspired me to not follow the 17 syllables, because I always tell people do 17 syllables or less, and it actually inspired me to break that habit that I've had for a decade, because her haiku was so fucking great, you know? So, like, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in have your rules for your practice, but if the rules start to feel stifling, fuck your rules. Change them. 
Fuck the rules. <laughs> so if no one else has anything to share, I just want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. It was really awesome for everybody to meet here like this. And, uh, you know, feel free to hang out. There's more chili and more matzo ball soup. Good. I just want to um, take this one opportunity to, to, to say one thing. Um, because like we are in a, a, a in a world that's turning right now, and it seems like it's turning really fast, um, and it seems like there's a lot going on, because uh, there is. Um, and one thing that I look to that has been a foundation that's been able to uh, kind of create my unique worldview uh, was being exposed to a film when I was younger. Um, and um, I'm sorry to do this. It's called um, Amazing Grace and Chuck, um, and I I've taken it upon myself to now uh, become a prophet of this because no, nobody seems to know and understand it exists. In 1984, uh, it's like Jamie Lee Curtis, Gregory Peck, like um, Alex English was the star for the uh, uh, three-point shooter for the Denver Nuggets. Um, he was an NBA star at the time. Um, he played the Michael Jordan of the era. Um, in this movie, I'm going to spoil I'm going to spoil the whole movie right here. But it doesn't matter because you need to see this. You need to understand this existed in 1985 or in 86 when this happened. So in all of our lifetimes and all of these things that like might kind of sound similar to this movie or whatever that, that might be relevant, you've never heard of it. But it's God I'm telling you, like, Jamie Lee Curtis, like, this is like Cisco and Ebert gave it two thumbs up. This was not underground. This was the narrative. And so the narrative is this. Has anyone, has anyone seen Has anyone ever heard of this? I'm just assuming. Amy has. Okay. So this is, and I grew up, well, my mom said she's in the room. I grew up in a, a cradle Unitarian um, at, over, at our overnighters. This is sort of stuff that we would have watched in, in, that, in that sort of, um, you know, non-denominational congregation, whatever. So, but it's not a religious movie at all. And so what happens is a kid, he's really good at baseball, the best baseball player on the scene. Um, and he's just good. He's not like in the best of anything. He's just he's just good. Um, and he also, in his science class, he built he's building a rocket. And so they go, they launch this rocket. And because somehow they live in Idaho in a town that has a a, nucle, uh, a, mis, a military base, some of the military people come to this these the science kids rocket launch. And they see it. It's really cool. It works. And they're like, you guys want well, you get to come tour one of our rocket launches, and they get to see a tour of inside of a base. And they see a nuclear missile. And they're all like, wow, whatever. And, then, and in it, like, the, the kid, he asks a question. They're asking some questions, and they're like, this is this thing. And they're like, you know, basically, you know, um, if, you know, if, this, if, if a nuclear bomb goes off, if your mom drops a fork before that fork hits the ground, she won't exist anymore. Um, and it's sort of, sort of, and they're just trying to give, wrap their heads around how powerful these things are. And there's like, and like, so we use these, so we don't have to use. We have these, so we don't have to use them. It was basically the line this kid's fed. So he goes home, and he has a nightmare. Of course, he has a nightmare. I mean, come on, he's like a kid. And he like goes the next day. It's a big baseball game. It's the first game of the season versus the Tigers. He goes out there. He gets out there. And he's like, can't do it. I can't play baseball. How can I play baseball? nuclear weapons are like right there like it's right there how can we go about doing this he's like i feel like this is what i do best and i can't do my i can't do my th i can't do my thing if that's happening like how can and so how can anyone and so uh, he does he, he doesn't play the game and they're like they forfeit the game and everyone's like sort of gets mad at him or whatever and that would be it but now it switches to boston the boston celtics and it's got like Red Arbach, the guy who owned the Celtics, he's in this movie. Like, the NBA was behind all this. Everybody's behind this. And he's like, you know, the, the star, Jamie Lee Curtis is his agent. And he's like reading the newspaper. And he's like, oh, did you hear about this kid? And he's like, she's like, oh, whatever. You contract $5 million. She's like, yeah, you know, I think I might want to meet this kid. Flies out, meets the kid. Mm -hmm. Lo and behold, he can't play basketball now. He meets the kid. He's like, what? This is crazy. Like, it's, and it's like, what? What are you talking about? He has a press conference and he's like, you know what? This kid's the truth. And like they asked him, he's like, he put, lets the kid talk. And the kid, he doesn't really have a lot to say. He's not a smart kid. He's just a little kid. He's like, I don't know. I tore this base. They got these weapons. And so, so, so that's kind of it's almost like this little buddy thing. Uh, lots of other sports people come to check this guy out or whatever. A lot of NFL players quit. Like all the whole sports world's up in arms or whatever. It's kind of this thing, but it kind of starts. It, it would kind of peter out because sports people don't really have that much power. But 
just thinking about all the things we know about in our in our past ten years with sports figures coming out and being ostracized and told not wasn't to stay in their lane, that this was the official message that was put out there is just kind of important. So, um, so, so that would be is trying to start Peter out, but like it was affecting sports. And so here's the spoiler alert: the mafia blows up Amazing Grace's plane. He gets killed uh, because it's messing up gambling. And so that kind of would kind of like they think that's going to rock everything back. But the kid, and this is the important part. This is the power we all have. We're not athletes. We're not even the best at any of the stuff we do. Problem. Um, the kid is crushed. He stops talking. He shuts up. He won't say a word. Eventually, like, and it's like other kids hear about this and it's, it spreads. There's like a, a, a captain, my captain moment in the classroom where one of his friends, like, you know, a teacher is like, you know, and another kid like shuts up and then all the kids shut up. And then, it, like, it's Hollywood, so it extrapolates. And basically, in Russia, the kids shut up. And in uh, North Korea, the kids shut up. And in China, the kids shut up. And the fucking parent, and so that's the only thing that forces them to the table. And the, and the meeting, like, and the, the movie, it ends, it's like, you know, the, he's meeting with the American president on a fucking plane. And he's like, you know, this doesn't just happen overnight. But, like, the fact is, the, the fact is like, the Russian president, the premier, his children aren't talking to him. Like, so we're going to do everything we can to give y'all a voice back. And so that's kind of shit. With all the amazing options we had as a species on this planet, we used to have in front of us, I'm, I'm scared that all we have left now is a thread the needle amazing Jer Grace and Chuck style <coughs> miracle that's on us like it's always been. But no one's ever heard of it, so people don't know. It was like we have to create this art now, but this art exists to inspire us out there. We just have to amplify it and help each other. And I don't know, that's not what this was about, but I feel like it'd be um, naive to have a gathering and not you know, address the million pound elephant in the atmosphere. So um, if you haven't seen it, I have it on DVD here. I can put it on right now. But, I don't know if you it. but definitely take it in and then think about that process, how that jives with what we've lived through and the media literacy that we're trying to process in this data age. So I don't know, that's that's what that's my shit right now is trying to get people to understand that we still have there is still one or two balloons left on the wall. We have a couple shots, but it's gonna take a lot more work than we've already put in. So One thing that's motivated me is my entire life I have lived in the James River Basin. And the James River Basin, which was not called the James River centuries ago, that is where the concept of America began. At the wrong end of the river, and it started creeping backwards up the river, and that's what America came from. So there is ancient voices in this area that has always been resistant to that, in the woods, along the river, like hiding. And living here, it's our duty to give voice to that and hear those things, you know? Not just hear, I mean, you can get lost in your phone and like be worried about the rest of the world, and you should be concerned about the world, but you're also here. And this is where the concept of the United States of America first started happening, so we can also start the process of undoing that here too. And I don't mean to get out of line, I don't know people's politics, but I'm all about tearing apart what we got right now because we definitely need something better. <laughs> so we're actually lucky to live in this space that this happened originally because we can disrupt it with our thoughts and our art and our words and the things we do Speaking it to the trees, man. You ain't even got to speak it to people. You can talk it in the woods or along the river, you know, and it'll flow on down the river like it gets out there. All right. Well, thank you.
Thanks everybody for coming out. Thank you. Woo! Yeah, thank you all for doing this. Thank you, thank you very much, Dolly, for coming down. It, yes. it was really awesome. Um, so, and we are here seven days a week, um, Monday through Friday, till four, 7 a.m. to 4.30, and on the weekend, 7 to 2. <laughs> and if y'all share, take a zine and take my card because you can follow my Patreon without subscribing. Like I do, like I've got a tag for public samples, so you can click the public samples and see a whole bunch of ridiculous shit that I've done over the last eight years without having to subscribe. So don't think it's a paywall, you know. Put the talk on the table if anybody wants to add or anything like that. Stand. Feel free to add. Stand. One. I have a haiku I wrote. Let's go. Yes. Hey, that's good. Oh, yeah. oh, well, it's, this is a haiku about abortion rights. Um, this is the haiku, because I literally spend half my waking thoughts thinking about that. Uh, so much is at risk this upcoming Tuesday. Get out and vote blue. Mm -hmm. I guess you're right. I'm James, I'm a high school senior, aspiring tattoo artist. That's my dad. Um, I don't work at Toronto counties. My best friend works here. And that's, well, basically my other dad. Um, okay, I just wrote it down because I, I was on the spot. My feet are so cold, I trudge through wet mud. My shoes will stay clean. I, I encourage my family to share any on the spot IQs. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, how many symbols was that laugh? I think that might have been it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll let y'all know at the Haiku Slams, we do a main tournament that you need like 20 Haiku, but we also do a battle roll every month that you only need two or three. You can show up and write a couple on the spot and just dip your toes in it. And you talked about being nervous. I always tell people when they come to them, Ain't nobody gonna look stupider than me. So <laughs> always feel confident that it's a good space you can share. Like nobody is gonna judge you, nobody's gonna be upset. And I'd love to hear the multiple generations, because if y'all both showed up and signed up, I love putting people like that against each other. Like a little, little father-son showdown, a little generational battle. second stanza called the Tonka that is 7-7. Seven, seven. When they originally did this, it was a party thing. And people would build off of each other's verses. And I used to do that with like small groups. We would have a party, we had notebooks, you would just see the one in front of you, and you'd write to respond to that and turn the page. And we'd get to the end of the night and share them. That sounds like something I'd like to see happen again. So maybe we work that out one time. We yeah. do a little, we do a little Ranga party here, and people can pass around notebooks and build off of each other. Yeah, <laughs> serving it. <laughs> Anybody else? Another fly of the moment. All right. Well, thanks everybody for coming out. Yeah, thank you. Have some more beer, wine. Process that haiku action. Is there water?